Hello, my name is Raj Mehta, and welcome back to our continuing video education on evidence-based medicine. We are going to be focusing on information mastery in this video. Information mastery mostly covers the important aspect of formulating a question as well as learning how to do appropriate literature searches and transitions into how to perform critical appraisals. The search for a medicine and the search for information always begins with a question. Framing this question is very important. After all, a good question is essential to finding the right answer. Now the first thing to know about in medicine is that there are generally two types of questions. There are foreground questions, and then there are background questions. Background questions are things novices or medical students might ask like the information about a disease, how it occurs, what are the history and physical findings. Foreground questions are more types of questions about treatments, prognosis, the best therapies for patients. They're the kind of questions that are more practically asked by more experienced or clinical physicians. Both questions are important in expanding our knowledge of medicine, but it's important to understand this distinction especially when one is looking to use evidence-based medicine to expand their knowledge base. When we're asking a question, there is a general format that is used. It is known as PICO, P-I-C-O. When we frame our question, we want to frame it using this PICO format. The P stands for our population or patient. So uh, when we're framing a question, we keep in mind the type of patients or populations involved. The second aspect of our question is the type of intervention that we are looking at using or learning about. The third aspect of our question should have a control or a comparison. The idea of a control or a comparison allows us to know what our alternative to our intervention might be. These go hand in hand. And finally, O is for outcome. How are we measuring the outcome of whatever intervention we wish to use? And how will that affect our patient care? Now, there are many types of questions we can ask. Most of the time we're interested in interventions because we're looking at some kind of therapy or treatment and what effect it may have. The other type of interventions we often discuss are maybe a prevention to see if we can prevent a disease from happening. Sometimes we'll look at studies to see if there are any potential harms, what might be happening if we do a treatment. We might be doing it to learn more about a diagnosis, or maybe to learn about prognosis of disease, or maybe we're just trying to simply build a bigger differential for what, be go what might be going on with our patients. So there are many different types of uh, questions we can look at, but in general this PICO format is a very helpful way to make sure we frame our question in, in, in a method that can allow us to then go about searching the best evidence to answer. Now let's go through an example with this. Let's say I have a patient who has type 2 diabetes. We'll say they have diabetes mellitus type 2. And I want to know what's the best way to treat a patient with diabetes mellitus. Now first of all, what kind of question am I asking? If I'm asking about treatment, this is more of a foreground question. If instead of treatment I want to learn more about what is diabetes, what does that mean, then that would be more of a background question. I could learn about it's caused by elevated blood sugars, and there's type 1, and there's type 2, etc. If I go reading about foreground, I might learn that type 2 diabetes is treated with metformin or insulin, etc. So I've created my question, and now I'm going to do the PICO format. So I need to first know my population, my patient, that I'm thinking about. So I'm thinking of type 2 diabetics, and maybe I know I'm thinking about someone who lives in the United States and might be elderly, etc. Then I'm thinking about intervention. I want to know 
what kind of way should I be trying to treat this patient? Should I be using oral medicines like metformin or insulins? And then I have a comparison. The comparison might be um, doing no treatment at all. And I want to know the outcome. I want to know, will my patient live longer? Will they be more comfortable? What are the things I'm measuring? Once I have this frame of a question in mind, I can then begin doing a search to find out an effective way to answer my question. I might be very surprised with my result. If I take a 90-year-old female with diabetes mellitus type 2, who also happens to have lung cancer, then maybe for that patient the best option is no medication treatment. She just should eat a nice healthy diet. If on the other hand I have a young 20-year-old male with diabetes mellitus type 2, maybe the best answer for that person might be just using metformin. Or maybe I need more details. Maybe I need to look into the state of their diabetes, etc. So as you can see, the answers can vary greatly based on the situation of my patient but searching for those answers can be done more easily by having a clearly framed question in mind that can then lend itself to me getting answers that are more easily applicable. Once we have our question in mind and framed, we have to begin by searching through evidence to find out what is the best answer to our question. However, in EBM, there is a hierarchy to the evidence. Not all evidence is equal. Where does this hierarchy come from? Well, historically, most people in medicine learned either from clinical observations or they learned from physiologic rationale. Although these two medicines are historically responsible for the great majority of our human history and the expansion of our knowledge, and they are extraordinarily important toward becoming excellent physicians, they have their limitations. Clinical observations are often done with just a small sample size. They're often unsystematic. Because of this, they're liable to be confounded by issues with placebo effect or natural history and aren't always the best and most reliable way to get answers. Physiologic rationale, although they can give us a lot of information or potential interventional effects, can occasionally be very wrong and don't always work in the real world as opposed to the laboratory. As a result, we try to use a more reliable method of evidence based on trials. And this has a hierarchy. Now the details of the hierarchy we'll get into later when we're talking about clinical appraisals, but we can briefly review this hierarchy. In general, the hierarchy of EBM, when we're looking at primary sources of clinical trials, usually places randomized control trials at the top, and as you can see, background information or expert opinion at the bottom. Now this is all unfiltered or primary source information. And trying to navigate through all this information, like doing PubMed searches or looking at articles, can be very overwhelming. This is one of the challenges of EBM. The usefulness of any question we ask or the information we want to find is pretty relatable in terms of the validity of the information that we find the relevance to our question inversely proportional to the work it takes to find it. And for many people, although we have this useful hierarchy of EBM, attempting to search for all these things causes so much work that the, finding the information is often not very useful. So despite having a well thought out question, they don't always get the information they need. Fortunately, this problem with searching for information has to some degree been alleviated by modern technology. In today's practice, we still have lots and lots of unfiltered information as primary source, but we have lots of resources that give us filtered information that process some of this so that it takes less work to find the information and it makes it easier to search for answers and look for the information we need. 
these sources of filtered information can be critically appraised articles, they can be topics, synthesis guidelines, systematic reviews. There are lots and lots of available resources. Most of them are known as POC tools or point of care tools. An example list of these is provided briefly here. As you can see there are many many different types of tools that people can use. In general for most people unless you have a very narrow field where we can look at unfiltered information and be aware of it most people rely on these other processes to get filtered information and to easily access information. But, like with any process, even though this will help you get through your search and some of your critical appraisal, you're still getting this as a secondary source. It's also important to keep in mind that relying on these sources mean, doesn't mean you should not have the skills to do critical appraisal yourself. It's very important to have this skill so that if there's any questions in your mind, you can do a critical appraisal yourself or look at really important groundbreaking studies if you need to so that if you rely on others, you still have the ability to do and go and look at it yourself. In future videos, we will be closely, more closely looking at this aspect of critical appraisal and how to judge the validity of our studies. So to summarize our video on information mastery, first it's important to have a good question in mind, to use the PICO format, and to know the difference between background versus foreground questions. Second, we have to understand that there is a hierarchy to evidence. And finally, we have to realize that the search for evidence usually is helped and assisted by using filtered or process sources that will often simplify and reduce the work involved to search for our question. Thank you so much for listening.